Can everybody hear me okay? Is that good? All right, great. I um, want to thank Grain Journal and, uh, and GFA for, for asking me to do this. Um, I know a lot of the people in the room, a lot of you have actually taught me everything that I know, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, if there's uh, any questions or anything throughout, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, sometimes at the end of the, uh, the presentation, you know, you don't have as much time or people are just looking to get out and hopefully I haven't put you to sleep or anything like that. But um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, also, you guys are the experts, so if, if I say something that uh, you think might be off or need a little clarification, feel free to correct me. I have no problems. Uh, accepting that I'm wrong on something. Um, so I appreciate it, and uh, we'll just get into it. So um, considerations in retrofitting a grain facility. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about expansions, um, you know, whether it's uh, layout considerations, engineering design considerations. Um, that's kind of more my specialty. Uh, get into the equipment uh, selection and uh, then also safety considerations, dive in a little bit or dabble with uh, operations during construction, and then a few case studies here and there. Um, okay, so here's one, one of the projects that we'll be discussing a little bit. This is a, a green field that we built in Humboldt, Tennessee. It was roughly 2.9 million bushels uh, capacity, uh, grain dryer receiving for trucks, receiving for uh, rail doing rail loadout, um, great, great project. Um, got a lot of experience and, and some lessons learned that I can share from this. Um, so starting off with layout considerations, um, always looking at you know, what, what's the goal that we're doing? Um, wh why are we running this project? What are we trying to get, achieve? So are we going for additional storage? Um, is it just, hey, we just need more storage? You know, our, our outreach is getting bigger. We don't want to turn the facility quite as much. Um, there's a lot with that. It, maybe it's blending. Hey, we need more for our off quality. Um, and then maybe just, hey, we set this place up to be a corn facility. And now, as times changed, we're getting into beans and wheat, and we want to hold that carry a lot longer. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why you might do something. Um, and we'll try to, try to get into those. Um, maybe increasing your speeds, saying, hey, you know, on our peak harvest, we used to get 200, 200 trucks in a day, and now we're at 450, and, you know, our farmers don't want to sit there and wait for four hours, you know, and, and staging and, and all that. So um, then there's also conditioning, loadouts, different, different things like that. Um, then really looking at your truck flows, you know, your scales, probe, staging, maybe you want to add a second scale, maybe you want to move your probe further away from that. Um, and then signage and, and different items. <clears throat> so some rail considerations um, would be maybe your switch times. Like if you don't have a loop track and you're doing eight cars at a time and you got to switch them, you know, you're going to add a lot of time there. And maybe you have demerge or different things that you have to meet with the railroad to get that timing of getting the cars in, getting them out, um, you know, looking at your overtime and, uh, over, you know, how's that going to affect your employees? Are you going to be able to run the facility and then load out all night long? Well, you're going to have to have different shifts, different work, you know, add to your staff. Um, one big thing is uh, the grade of track that we've found. Um, and then when you're selecting an engine or a track mobile, whatever it might be, um, you may say, OK, we want to get a track mobile and we're looking to switch eight cars at a time. That's great. They say you should get this one, give you a recommendation. Well, if you leave out that you're on a half a grade slope, half percent grade slope, well, that's going to be, you know, you might be knocked down to five cars at a time. You may need to be doing more with air brakes, different things like that. So really sizing your, your track mobile is key and letting them know uh, before you purchase it that you have a, you know, what you're going to be doing, what, what the existing conditions are. Um, other things would be railroad agreements. Um, those always take time. Getting approval from them, maybe it's a, a crossing or something like that, but if you gotta get the railroad's approval on something, I mean, that can be nine months if you're adding a switch. Uh, 
it just takes a long time and you need to start that process as early as possible. Um, <clears throat> so getting into some engineering and design. <clears throat> there it goes. So determining with your contract and, and what you're going to be doing moving forward with the project once you get approval and, and awarded um, the funds to, to move forward, you're going to look at do you have design build? Are you going to go design bid build? Um, a lot of times it's, it's best if you have the time in your schedule to get that engineered ahead of time. Um, that way you can send it out for bids and you have apples to apples comparisons on what you're getting. Maybe you're going to go and develop a, a spec sheet, a spec book. Um, that way you know, hey, they're bidding not just a 20,000 bushel an hour drag, but we like these rails, these liners, all the different ins and outs of that equipment. Um, and then when you do an expansion, obviously you've got existing conditions. So did you design that ahead of time for a future expansion? Um, do you have the drawings? Uh, are the drawings accurate? Um, a lot of times you have to have come, come in and do like a structural assessment um, just to, to add on. But 3D scanning has been very beneficial and it's kind of made leaps and bounds over the last you know, 10 years even. You can go out and get a 3D scan for a few thousand dollars, put that into a point cloud, and then have uh, your engineering firm know exactly that everything's going to match up. You've got the slopes on your spouting, everything you need. Um, we've found that to be very, very beneficial. Um, and then, you know, obviously choosing the, the consulting firm that has the capability, has the knowledge, uh, the experience, and maybe the track record with your company, or maybe it's a new one. But that's that's key because you know going from that to then the construction phase of that anytime there's a contractor you know they don't know what to do if you got a good response time that that just really helps out having a good relationship with the engineering firms and then what are the deliverables um, you want to make sure that you're getting detailed engineering drawings um, enough that they can construct off of but then also sometimes they say well that's our design well no, it's not your design anymore because we just paid for it. So you got to have that in your uh, in your contract that we get the drawings. You know, we get everything that we need. So that in the future, if we want to do something, we can go and have another engineering firm, or maybe that engineering firm's out of business and you don't have the drawings. And it just takes a lot more uh, on the front end of an expansion if you don't have the information. <coughs> um, getting into some structural engineering. Uh, geotechnical and soil borings, um, obviously that's just very key depending on, you know, where you're at. If you, may, if you have some existing ones, they may say that that's good enough and they can do a, a report for adding a bin right next to where you had another bin. Um, but getting their recommendation on, on what you want to have done and, you know, the price is cheap up front to get it done and it can save a lot when you look at differential settlement of a bin. Um, and then also throughout the construction phase, uh, quality control and special inspections. You want to make sure that you're getting the concrete you're paying for, the, the rebar is getting placed correctly. Um, there's a lot with you know hoop stress and, and making sure that things are constructed the way they were designed. Um, and then I kind of talked a little bit about structural assessment of existing, but if we're adding on to something that's existing, you obviously need to know that it's going to act the way and still be up to code and, and allow for the additional loading or anything like that. A um, little more with the geotechnical, um, they'll propose, you know, how many borings, but you need to tell them, hey, here we're, here we're adding a bin, it's a 105 bin and it's 750,000 bushels and this is the type of construction we're going to do for the ring wall. Um, and then they'll come up with, here's our recommendations for allowable soil bearing pressure and different items like that. And then um, cost implications. So, you know, you get this uh, geotechnical subsurface investigation done and, okay, you got a report now, what does that mean? You know, you got to look at if, if they want pilings or if they want geopiers, uh, they want you to over excavate and then go through and um, put an engineered fill, that, that obviously is enough to add some additional costs that you, you may not want to be doing, but uh, it is necessary, you know, 
follow what they're talking about, and it, it does add a lot to the project cost. So knowing that up front, rather than getting out there and starting to excavate, and you know, we have somebody come out and doing, uh, you know, an inspection of it, and they say, "Wow, this ground is no good." Um, it's just better to get that up front. Um, a little bit with loading considerations. Uh, look at the area you're at. Um, if there's high seismic or earthquake loads, potentials, and the codes, um, there's going to be a different design that you kind of have to follow. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting everything great. And then uh, load path, you know, following down, hey, we're adding a truss onto this tower, and, you know, how does that load actually come down through? Are we doing slip connections? Are we doing a hard connection at one end? How does that load on wind, snow, just live loads, whatever, get down to the foundations, and how is that designed? To, you know, where the, maybe the tower is good when you're adding on to it, but have somebody check the foundation and make sure that, that that's going to be adequate as well. Um, looking at your deflections and what that might do as well. You have a real, you know, 200-foot tower that's going to have some wind deflections and things moving. You know, are your trusses and your your towers and spouting and everything able to to take that deflection and move and not be putting stresses into things that that shouldn't be? Um, and then looking at future loading, always, obviously, we always try to plan ahead and say what could happen after this project. Yeah, we don't see anything. You know, this should top out our facility and it's going to be everything we need. Well. In the future, you know, things change, so um, got to consider that. And then uh, some of the common overlooked items that we've, you know, had issues with are bin roof loading. Um, temp cables is another big one. You just say, hey, we got a, a bin, we're going to have temp cables in it, and you tell the bin manufacturer, okay, well, that's actually pretty important information. Um, you know, what, what type of cable is it? How long is it? Um, uh, what's the diameter of it? The more the increased diameter of a temp cable really actually adds quite a bit on the friction of when you're pulling down, when you're when you're reclaiming that grain out of the silo, and um, that will that will pull quite a bit. If you don't have it a good anchor down and it doesn't stay straight when the grain fills up and it goes to the side, well then when you start reclaiming that, that's pulling even more, and you can have tear out uh, from the bin support at the roof, and you know trying to get that out of the reclaimed conveyors and, or that gets into the leg or, or whatever, that can really damage a lot of things. So having that set up ahead of time is, is really good. Um, looking at peak supports, um, what are you going to be doing now, future? Are you going to span over the bin? Are you going to support it off the bin? You got, everyone here knows um, bin roofs come with different capacities. So you can get a 20,000, a 50,000 pound bin peak capacity, well, you need to make sure that that's coordinated um, by the engineers, the manufacturers, everyone. And then are you going to have two leg towers or maybe even four leg towers braced back to the bins? Well, there's certain ways you want to do it, certain spacing, you need to make sure that the, the bin is designed for that. Um, you don't want to just come in and add them because you did it on one project. It might not be able to be done on this one. Um, <clears throat> And then, you know, your anchor connections above tunnels. That's another big one that we see issues with. Uh, you might have a bin foundation design, and you say anchor bolts, and they're grade B7, and you're going to embed them 14 inches, and they're one-inch anchors. Well, that's great, but then when you get to the bin tunnels, the reclaim tunnels, you're going to have a big, large beam over that spanning. You're going to have all of your... Uh, hoop bars going through there, well, those don't just break and stop at the tunnel. Those are going to then go over the tunnel and under the tunnel into the foundation. Uh, you want to make sure that that's designed properly. A lot of times it's a, pay, a space constraint on, on getting that all that extra steel to go above and below. And then the anchors, a lot of times, you know, you might see on a drawing, weld anchors to tunnel beam. Okay, great. How do you do that? What do you do that with? Um, that's not enough information. You know, if you have a grade B7 anchor, um, that's actually not a weldable anchor that you want to put to mild steel. So right there, you're going to probably have a failure. If you just say weld it, they may just stitch weld that on. Well, if you're going to stitch weld it, you know, you, you're not going to have that shear capacity that you really want in there, and you're going to shear those off. Uh, you want a full penetration weld. Those are some of the things that we've seen. So, so making sure that your engineering firm knows these things and calls these out, and then you have the quality control to have somebody inspect it 
before it's fully completed in construction will save you a lot later, um, just making sure that you don't have issues down the road. <clears throat> um, a little bit more with the high seismic areas, um, that, that can a lot of times add to additional design. Um, the bin heights may be limited, like a, a 105 we were looking at at that Humboldt, Tennessee site. We were going to do 105s and we wanted 750,000 bushels out of them. Well, with the seismic that we had and that design, we were only able to go about 690,000 bushels. So that changes, you know, your outcome, what you're, what you're trying to do and accomplish in the project. You know, do you then get another smaller bin? Do you really need that additional little bit? Just consider that. Um, and then you might have, as you can see in the picture here, um, increased stiffeners. They may not be full length of the bin, but uh, you might have increased stiffeners, more anchors uh, or larger anchors uh, in diameter of the anchor bolts. Um, <clears throat> foundations for corrugated bins, um, looking at the differential settlement. A lot of times, you know, every manufacturer is different, but they say we don't want more than a quarter inch differential settlement on a 10 foot spacing, um, or maybe one inch from one side to the other. Uh, we don't want to have it tilting. That obviously adds a lot of different loads into the side walls when you have that full of grain. And, and it won't be plumb and it hurts the equipment up top and, and trusses and connections and everything else. So really narrowing that down and knowing what you're gonna get, um, maybe looking at stage filling. The first time you fill it, you go up you know, 25%, wait however many days, maybe have a surveyor out. And they come out and once every other day or, or something like that, monitor, is that been settling? Okay, it's, it's stabilized, go another 20% on the fill. Um, but an engineering firm would help you with that stage filling and uh, you know, get a surveyor out there and just monitor that it's gonna go evenly as much as possible. If you just fill it up all the way, well, if there are any soft spots, that's gonna be a lot more if you just initially do it. <coughs> Sorry. Um, openings, we talked about that with the rebar going through. Just make sure that those are designed properly um, and the stresses are, are good. A um, little bit more with permitting, so you may not think of this up front, but uh, hopefully an engineering firm or someone else would, but do you need a stormwater pollution prevention plan? Um, if you're disturbing more than an acre of ground, a lot of times you're going to be required by the state to, to issue one of those, and that's actual construction drawings um, telling you where the silt fence is, how you to do different items with runoff. Um, a big one that we deal with is air permits. Um, depending on how big your facility is, if it's a green field and you're over two and a half million bushels of storage capacity and your throughputs and what you plan on doing, um, that's gonna require you to get then emissions testing. And, and that is not easy to achieve those results that you need. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in, in a little bit here, but uh, that's a tough one. So knowing if you need to have an air permit, some states might not require the air permit, but Federal still requires it, so you might not need it for the state, and maybe they're not checking it, but maybe you still need to get that testing done. Um, that testing, you know, if you're doing stack testing, visual emissions, all that, that can add up. I mean, you could be at a $50,000 bill, and nobody wants to just eat that out of their contingency, so, so planning for that ahead of time is, is important. Um, if you're out in a rural area and you got a septic system, the, the leach field soil testing plan from a surveyor, um, they go out and make sure that, that percolates or the, the ground is suitable for that. If it's a real tough clay, you might not be able to even do a leach field. Um, but then once you have that leach field, you can't, you got to flag that off and make sure no construction happens because once you disturb that, that virgin ground, um, they're going to say you can't use that anymore or you have to retest it and maybe it'll work. But, but de determining that up front and then blocking that area off is, is another key thing to look at early on. Um, and then we don't deal a lot with the application for aquatic resource alterations permit, ARAP. That's more, uh, you know, if you're altering a ditch, if you've got some culverts and that goes downstream to a river or whatever, the, the Department of Environmental Con Conservation for that state may require you to do that. 
Um, <clears throat> getting into equipment selection, I'm kind of going to go a little bit quick on some of it just with the, the matter of time that we have, but a lot of these we could probably talk, you know, full hour and a half on just conveyors or, or bucket elevators. So I'll just dabble and hopefully I can come up with something that might make you think about it uh, for next time. Um, not saying that I'm going to tell you everything you need to know, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we can take something out of this. So conveyors we'll talk about. Um, belts, chain drags, uh, augers. Um, here you can see the belt conveyors. We've got uh, our single idler roller type on top. That's kind of the most common, um, maybe changing now that we have the, the three idler roller type. Uh, it seems to be um, a hit, <laughs> I guess. Um, but it does hold a little bit more grain and we'll get into that. Um, chain drags is just a typical, every, <coughs> typical cut sheet of that. Um, you know, some of the pros and cons and looking at the two different types that are most common, which would be the belt and the drags, um, the, the belts are a little bit more gentle in the commodity. So if you've got a food grade facility, if you're looking at uh, ethanol, whatever it might be, if you don't want to have that damage, you could potentially have a, a little bit less of a quality if you're doing drags. Maintenance um, on conveyors and trusses. If they're up on the air, you know, how high are they off the ground, off the platform? Um, how are you going to get to them, making sure you have enough access? Uh, it's kind of a personal preference. We've seen it spread out between our different sites in our company. And, you know, some guys say, no, I'd never put a belt up top. Um, if the belt breaks, you got to, yeah, you can splice it. But then if it goes bad, you know, you got to get a crane in there. You got to get all the belt redone. Well, you know, if, if a chain breaks, I just got to take a couple links up there, get it, replace those few that broke, and get it back up and running, and it's, you know, close to no downtime, you can get it done quick. Well, those are some of the differences that we see just preference-wise. Um, and then weather conditions, you know, if you're up in Canada or down in Florida, you're going to have different scenarios. So, you know, if you got freeze down of belts, um, you know, condensation or moisture or something getting in there and freezing that belt down to the bottom pan, well, you may want to install creep drives if you use that, that belt a lot. Um, make sure that you have zero speed sensors and different things like that. You know, in a matter of a minute, you could probably, you're spinning, the belt's not moving, that pulley, you, you, you could be burning that belt up in a matter of a minute. And, you know, so consider some of the different electrical and, and hazard monitoring that you could, uh, put in up front that might save you some trouble. <clears throat> um, length conveyor. Drags may be more cost effective than belts, um, but obviously depends on length. You don't want to go over 300 feet with the drag. Usually you don't even see them that long. Um, and then electrical cost as well. So drags typically have a larger motor, um, larger drives, and that may have a little bit more on the aspect of uh, upfront electrical. Yeah, you can get that equipment for that price, but what else do you have to do to get it installed and to run it? Um, one thing that, that we kind of look at is, you know, on a rough on a green field, you're looking at maybe electrical costs of about $650 uh, per horsepower when you're estimating. You, beginning of the project, you know, what do we think the electrical is going to come in at? The hazard monitoring, running the conduits, powering it, starters, buckets, all that. You can kind of say roughly around 650. Um, if it's a small expansion, something like that, and you got some of the existing equipment already there, maybe you're looking at 600 bucks a horsepower. Uh, so you got a, um, a 15 horsepower difference between your, your drag and your belt. You're looking at you know roughly $10,000 in difference uh, in electrical costs. So yeah, you might be able to get that belt for 50,000 and the drag for 40. Or just looking at that difference is is key. And then um, we also say just if it's a you know, half horsepower, one horsepower, it's a valve, it's a gate, whatever it might be, you just round that up to five horsepower um, and then take that price. So maybe roughly $3,000 for every gate motor. Um, it's not just a, hey, I have a half horsepower, so I'm only going to put you know, $325 in on my assumed cost. Round that up because I do have to get all that out there and, and the controls and everything for it. 
Um, looking at intermediate discharges, if, you, if you're going to a bunch of different bins and you're filling, um, belts, they can have a tripper or a plow, usually zero degrees on the, on the incline. Uh, some can maybe get up to two degrees and, and still work, but it depends on the manufacturer. So you could do that, uh, maybe in a flat storage building, that, that's a good idea. Um, but if you got a movable tripper or something like that, you're gonna have an open belt. So you wanna look at what that's gonna do with the environment and everything else. Is it an enclosed space? Anything like that. Um, both have their issues with clean out. Uh, none of them are perfect. Um, they do now have for, for food grade a lot of times they'll be putting these new clean drags and the, the gate is actually part of the bottom pan so you don't have that lip of where that commodity can sit. Um, larger openings, different things to try and get that so that the carryover doesn't go past. You can put carryover cups on a drag, things like that, but, but looking at that um, and what you're trying to do, is it, is it okay that you get a little bit of beans in a corn bin? You know, maybe it doesn't really matter. Um, piggybacking conveyors. Uh, you can consider, you know, what, what that elevation is on the truss. If you gotta get up and it's just one straight truss catwalk, you're gonna have a lot of height to get to that head section. And, you know, maybe you don't have the safety around that, the guardrails, different things like that. Maybe you have um, an offset. So you can come out to a bin uh, on a bin peak structure. Maybe you have the top uh, truss coming out and then that goes down and then there's another truss lower and you can either put a, a two-way valve in to go to that bin or the next conveyor that way you don't have to mess with the heights so you're kind of piggybacking it that way we've seen it also where you you come in and you have an opening in the tail section of the next drag conveyor and you actually go through that to fill that bin and if you want to go out to the next bin you you close that gate and it's a little more wear and tear on on that conveyor that it's going through but uh if you got the height limitations and, and things like that, maybe it's something you want to look at. Um, and then uh, both can have valves, uh, you know, whether you got a belt or a drag, you can have a valve in there, but it does add quite a bit to that, that elevation. Um, another thing to look at is, you know, the, the weights of these conveyors. So like a 20,000 bushel an hour M26 by 20 drag conveyor, you're looking maybe around close to 300 pounds per linear foot for that conveyor. Whereas uh, a belt, you might only be 115. That's a big difference when you're talking about what your structures need to support way up in the air above a bin. Um, so that also should play a little bit of a factor into which one you decide you wanna go with. And then looking at uh, older bin roof capacities, a lot of times you have a bin that's been there for 10 years and you wanna go out to the next bin or add a bin well, is that peak structure gonna be able to handle that or are you gonna to have to then do a, a truss or a box truss and span over that existing bin and get rid of what you have currently? Um, and then obviously looking at uh, future. So yeah, we're gonna stop out at the bin peak of this one and we don't wanna continue our truss over top of it. Well, make sure you got the loading that if you do ever wanna go off to that next bin in the future, you got that included and they, they know that in the design of the bin ahead of time and then looking at your bridge and tower capacities. So if you're going from a belt to, uh, going from a belt to a drag conveyor, we did have one project that we just finished up. Uh, we just had year over year, just tons of issues with this, this uh, belt and it had plows and it would then go to the different bins that it was spanning over. Well, we finally just said, hey, we're, we're done with this. The site guys wanted to have a drag put in. So we piggybacked that. Well, that added a lot of load to that truss. And we had to come in there and uh, put in some, instead of the you know, little two leg towers that we had existing, we had to come in and put in four leg towers and brace that, that truss up and really make sure that the structure was, was adequate for that. I mean, just going in there, if we would have just went in there and just replaced it, said, hey, it's a conveyor, we're gonna go from belt to drag, no big deal. Well, we could have had some issues, you know, trusses falling down on bins, safety, all that, so definitely consider those. Um, and then inclines, uh, typically you're gonna increase your belt size uh, of your conveyor, maybe around six degrees. Um, you can increase speeds and, and all that, but you know, looking at that 
slope of that conveyor, knowing that ahead of time and uh, making sure you select the right equipment and get that full throughput that you're looking for. Um, and then you can go with a cleated. Um, it's not always the best situation, but 10 degrees or higher on belts, you can go with cleated. And then drags, you know, you can have a bend section, um, 15, 30, 45, you can get custom ones as well. I mean, you can get even more than 45 with some of these. And then uh, consider if you do have big bends in your conveyors, maybe oversizing them and reducing the speed. That way, if they're not getting you exactly what, what you want, as far as bushel per hours, you can maybe increase that speed. Looking at the, the different components, how easy is that to, to ramp up the speed? You know, maybe you have a VFD, maybe you, maybe you don't. Um, it's kind of a little bit tough to see. Maybe it's just my angle, but uh, here you can see just a, a slight incline that we had from uh, some drier and wet bins getting into the wet and dry legs. So it's, it's definitely doable to get that with the drag. Um, cost considerations um, with these. So drags are typically a little less expensive depending on the length and then belts typically have less expensive drives in the electrical installation cost. Um, and then as, as I was talking earlier, the, the belt weights, uh, belt conveyor weights versus a, a chain drag up on the tower, well, you could be looking at maybe 40 to $100 a foot of that truss that you have increased cost to support that drag. Um, so consider that as well. And then um, belts typically have a little bit less electrical usage cost. And um, then look at you know, what you think maintenance-wise you're going to have cost on that and in installation. Um, just a quick, uh, quick comparison. So this is a belt conveyor with single idler or the three idler style. You can see if you're going 600 feet per minute, you're at 19,700. Well, with the three idler, you do have that added capacity here up to like 20,600. Um, once you get to the bigger conveyors, it really starts to be a bigger gap. So, I mean, you're going at 400 uh, feet per minute is giving you your 20,000, whereas you might have to be, you know, 475 feet per minute to really get that, that same one. So, if you put in the three idler and you're going at that speed, you may have down the road, you say, hey, you know, we put in all this other equipment, now we can go at 25,000 an hour. What does that do um, to our conveyors? Do we have to replace them? Well, maybe you can just speed it up a little bit and then, and then meet that demand. Um, just looking at drags here, uh, difference between a 20 by 20 or a 26 by 20, um, you're looking at 160 feet per minute or 120 feet per minute. So consider maybe going with a little bit bigger uh, sections and uh, increasing the size of that, and you can then have some room for growth in the future as well. Um, augers uh, are good for lower speeds, you know, blending, metering. Um, if you've got a real tight, small space, yeah, maybe you want to put one in. Um, then, obviously, if you have a longer auger, you're going to have a, a larger torque arm, and that motor is going to be a lot bigger, and, you know, you're plugging that up, you're going to have some issues. So look at that and what the horsepower might be. Um, one issue we had was we put one in, <coughs> and it wasn't extremely long. It might have been 20 feet for the auger, and we went through and said, hey, make sure this torque arm's good or the motor's going to be good. Everything is designed properly, and we know that this is going to come off of a fines bin. <coughs> And off the fines bin, we're going to meter it into our incoming grain and then blend it before it gets out to the bins. Well, you open that up, that gate up, and it's just plugging up. And you're making a hole and you're prodding it with rebar, doing whatever you can to get it out of there. Well, you don't want to sit there for eight hours and do that while you're receiving grain. So um, you want to open that thing full. And, and we, what we did is we put a small metering auger in instead of having this one extend all the way out. So we, we changed that, put in a metering auger. This one could then run full speed and it had that capability. And then we had put a VFD on the smaller one and, and we can trickle it in a little bit or as fast as we want, but it really solved a lot of issues having that. And uh, thinking of that up front would have saved some money as well. Bucket elevators. Um, We've got some, we've had a lot of discussions around that this 
in our company lately, um, looking at you know soft starters, VFDs, jacking drives, um, the inspection, you know, placement of those panels, and you know, replacing buckets. Well, some places, oh, we can just jog it and do our inspections with the soft starter. Well, after a while, you can be burning those soft starters up. If you have, um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, we're going to do this with a VFD and we'll have a backstop on it. Well, what if, you know, that's not truly locked out to make sure that when the guy's hands are in there, they're not getting, you know, hurt, damaged, whatever. Um, you know, somebody could accidentally bump that VFD up. So that's a big safety concern. Um, so what we do is a lockout, tag out on the actual motors of the leg, and then we'll put in a jacking drive. And, and then you know that that conveyor's only going at that slow speed, so you have a little bit more safety with that, and, and you're protecting your guys from anything that you know may happen. Another thing, too, is getting the backstop and having a jack and drive will help. Uh, maybe you're replacing a bunch of buckets, and that belt is heavier on one side off the pulley, and that friction force might overcome that. Um, you could have that off-balance loading, and it could just start to take off on you while you got your hands in there doing bucket replacement, things like that. And that's, that's a big concern because, you know, you got your hands in there and a bucket starts taking your arm up and you only have, yeah, just got to consider that safety-wise. It's a lot easier to do up front than to add it later. And then looking at, you know, shovel pockets, uh, explosion panel access, so you, you have your ladder going up a leg. Why not coordinate that so that your ladder is hitting every explosion panel if wind blows off, you know, pressures, maintenance inspection on them. You don't have to get a JLG out there to do it. You can actually just go up the ladder and inspect them. Um, <clears throat> and then lagging, looking at uh, vulcanized or slide lagging. Do you want crowned uh, on the edges? Different things like that. Um, uh, storage structures, there's all sorts of different kinds. I'm not gonna get into this one's better for this or that. That's a whole nother it's a whole nother presentation another day, but uh, you got your steel, your concrete, flat storage, you know, ground piles, all that. Um, selecting which one's going to be best for what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve. You're not just trying to get capacity, but, you know, what's that product going to be after a pile? What's it going to be after it sits in a building? Is it going to be turned a lot of times? Um, those are all considerations that you need to, to work out up front, you know, if you got a grain silo and... Uh, you're looking at turning it two times a year, that's a little different than turning it 20 times a year. So they may bump up the design on that a little bit. Um, and then, uh, you know, are you gonna have sweeps or bobcat doors? How are you gonna reclaim that? Uh, you know, if you don't have a, a lot of turns on the bin, maybe they wanna go with the bobcat doors and um, it's kind of a personal preference of whoever it is. Maybe they already have them at the site and they don't want sweep. Zero entry obviously is the, the safest way if we can do sweeps, but um, then grain spreaders, do you want that to fill just right from the middle or do you want to spread it out? Uh, temp cables, your roof loads, and then man doors. Sometimes we'll put a man door on each side of the bin. Um, that helps with confined space rather than just having one um, for when you do have to enter in and sweep it up or inspect or do anything when it is empty. Uh, there's just a picture of a bobcat door. Um, a lot of times it'll be the top and bottom and you open the bottom and some of the grain will spill out after you've reclaimed as much as you can. Well, maybe you put a bobcat up there underneath that little angle right there and uh, help hold that in place, you know, as you're taking bolts out and things like that so it doesn't just swing open on you. <coughs> spouting. Obviously you want to look at your size of your spouting. Um, make sure you're not choking down your system just because of you know, the contractor had this on site and decided to put it in. Um, look at your lengths. Do you need a truss spout? What are your liners? Um, if you put in a half inch liner on the side and the, and the bottom, well, that's going to decrease that space if you're going, it depends on the commodity, maybe 60 uh, or 70 uh, bushels per square inch on that spouting. Well, that takes out a lot of capacity in your flow. Um, and then look at your access to inspect and reline. Um, a lot of times if you've got 10 foot sections of spouting and you can't get to it, you can't take that lid off, it's 10 foot long, it's out in the middle of nowhere, it's tough for you guys to get out there, maybe consider going with five foot lids on those 
spouts, and then it's a little bit more manageable. Um, and then looking at flow retarders, cushion boxes, any of that. Um, doing okay on time. So uh, dust collection systems, we've been getting into that a lot on our projects and make sure we have an engineered design um, going out and actually having the manufacturer, whoever, do a detailed design, know that you're gonna have the CFM that you need. And then um, looking at what, what's required uh, for truck receiving or loadout or rail receiving loadout. Um, and then looking at your NFPA requirements in those areas as well. So here is a loadout that we installed and we lifted up the dust system and we were looking at our emissions testing. Sorry about that part right there. Um, but you can see the, the dust of that filling in. It's just billowing up in the rail car. This isn't gonna pass the 5% emissions that's allowable. Um, so basically, when you're doing the testing, you're gonna stand back at a distance and you're gonna look and is that obstructing your view 5%, which is really hard to meet actually, but 5% obstructed view with that dust in the air. Um, that's what you're gonna be required to do if you do have to do this uh, with your air permit and get that testing done. Now, adding dust hoods and having them properly designed, this is what you can come up with. And um, I will point out too that there's a little bit of spacing between the hoods because this spout was on a pendulum as the rail car goes. That way if it does catch on any grain or anything of the car, it won't necessarily you know, rip the spout off. But you can see we're, we're filling here, I think at uh, 40 to 50,000 an hour into that car. And these dust hoods properly sized are going to suck that dust up and it is night and day difference. If you couldn't hear it, sometimes you wouldn't even know that it was, it was being loaded out into the rail car. Um, we did put these on to get out of the, the envelope of the rail. Um, we put them on a winch system so they have telescoping um, UHMW lined on the inside of each of the telescoping spouts itself. Um, and then we always were, at this site, we were always filling cars going this way. So once the grain builds up in the car, you're not gonna have it billowing up as much. So we actually had uh, two, a longer spout or a longer dust hood on the, the side it's coming from and the side it's going to has a little bit shorter. It doesn't need to be that full length, which, which will help out. Um, here's a truck loadout. So this is a, a dust suppression hopper. There's all sorts of different kinds, but you can tell that is a good grain column. It's not billowing up in the truck. Trucks are actually allowed 10% opacity on the emissions. Um, so a little bit more because they are open and, and they understand that that's gonna be a little bit tougher to, to, to achieve. Um, so we added this in because our, our spouting wasn't, from the rail was not actually good enough on the emissions. Um, so we added that in there and it was, it was and that's 25 feet up too. So items like that, there's a lot of them out there. Really look at those in the design and you know, is it enclosed, is it not enclosed? What, what might you wanna tell them ahead of time? But that was 20,000 bushels an hour, I think, load out into a truck. <coughs> Bulk wares, um, looking at the sizing of the upper and lower garners. A lot of times what we'll do is that weigh hopper. Um, the upper garner might be one and a third times the, the size of the weigh hopper. Well, if you're filling in and you don't wanna be stopping your conveyor that's filling it and you're switching between cars, things like that, if you wanna keep everything rolling, we'll sometimes uh, double the weigh hopper capacity into the upper garner. And it doesn't add a lot of money. We're, not, we're only increasing the upper garner by about two thirds roughly on the capacity of that, but it really, helps us out so that we don't have to start metering how much we're going. We can just reclaim full blast and we know that the, the bulk wear is gonna keep up as we're loading out. Um, maybe not needed as much for like a loop track or something like that. Uh, if you're going into trucks or going into anything else, you wanna consider these. Um, looking at the speed of the system, sometimes we'll you know pay the extra little bit to go from, yeah, our loadout conveyors at 50,000 bushel an hour what does it take to get a 60,000 bushel an hour bulk wear? Know that we're gonna keep up with that. Um, 
and it's gonna do what it wants to do. It's, it's real minimal money in the, in the grand scheme of everything. And then access for maintenance, a lot of times you'll come up and have to go around the bulk wear and then go up another ladder and go around it and then go up. If you just add that foresight of, of platform catwalk, we're talking a couple thousand dollars and, and it's a lot easier it's a lot easier for egress if you do need to do something quick, but look at those considerations of you know, minor adjustments to the bulk wear that they see a lot, but it's not in their base, you know, their base price. And then test weights, uh, depending on the state, it might be two, three years that you have to send those off and get those um, certified. Well, how are you gonna get them down? Those things can be pretty heavy. Um, are you gonna have something where you can lower them through hatches that you take out of the grating? Are they gonna be a crane? Are you gonna have some sort of uh, a jib crane? Or do you wanna just have a crane come in? Look at those um, and consider that ahead of time. And then kind of roll through this, but wet storage and dryers, you know, sizing your storage for blending capa uh, capabilities. If you have multiple commodities, you might want to uh, have additional wet storage if you got different things or you're just trying to store some wet to blend it later. Well, if you're receiving it and your dryer can't keep up, that's uh, you know looking at the incoming and what you can do on a speed with that. And then dry leg flows, make sure you're, uh, you're receiving grain, your, your main leg or your main legs, those are gonna be at uh, a certain capacity and you're drying at the same time. Well, if you're going out to a bin, you wanna go to that same bin, it's not just the speed of your, your receiving, you wanna add in whatever speed you have for your dryer. That way you can trickle that in at the same time. So maybe you have a 20,000 bushel an hour uh, receiving leg and then a 25,000 bushel an hour uh, fill conveyor. That way you can be taking 5,000 from your dryer, putting it into it, or maybe have two, two different tiered um, conveyors on a box truss, uh, whatever it might be, but but think about those, and if you're going in a, a, a line of bins, you know, do you wanna go out to the furthest bin with the dry and re-receiving to the first one? You may wanna add some valving in there as well and have two conveyors. Um, electrical considerations, uh, are you gonna automate? Are you gonna do PLC? Are you gonna do it in the future? Or do you wanna have a, just the bare bones now and then add on to it, make sure you're getting the right system and uh, it has the, the capability to be added on to and get you a little bit more in the future. Um, you don't want to be stuck with one specific thing and you can never do more with it. Um, looking at your hazard monitoring, local disconnects, um, up on towers and stuff, going up, locking it out, coming back down, testing it, going back up, you know, that, that wears on you a lot if you have to have that specific person doing the lockout that is going to also be the one opening it up. Um, so look at local disconnects for that and then network considerations. Are you gonna get your network out to the dump, to the office, to where, you know, to be doing that PLC? Um, so some safety considerations. Um, let's see, okay, on time. Uh, full grading on catwalks. I always try to push this as much as I can because you're doing maintenance up on that conveyor or whatever it might be. If you just have one of those grip struts, um, you know, you could be dropping tools, trying to grease a bearing, different things like that. You wanna make sure you're protecting your guys. Um, here's just a you know, typical grip strut. One thing to note is that you'll see these a lot of times and that's great, but maybe there'll be a conveyor leg or a conduit or spouting or something that's interfering with that. Well, you can't just cut out a section of this and say, oh, it's still good. Well, I mean, it's, it's got a certain span and this is all the structure to support that grip strut. So you don't wanna cut out half your beam if you have a beam supporting something on a tower. You're not gonna cut out half your beam and say, oh, it's still good. I mean, you, you gotta know that that's properly installed and maybe you have to add an angle to support that side of that or reinforce it somehow. Um, here's one conveyor that we had installed on a, on a truss and you know you got the grip strut that actually looks pretty good. You've got, it looks a little narrow on here, but you've got your guardrail, and then this is right next to it, no big gaps, anything like that. Well, ignore this below, it was on the ground before they lifted it, and it was in our receiving slab, so that's all just below. But if you have your grip strut and then a conveyor and you got eight inches, well, you're walking down there at night, servicing something, whatever, if you're 
trying to get over something and you come back, I mean, your foot can fall through there. I'm not saying a person might be able to, but look at that. You know, if you have full grading, you don't have to worry about that. Um, also, if you have an incline on the truss of the conveyor and that's going up at a slope, well, you might only have an eight inch gap vertically, uh, but then at the end of the conveyor, you might have three feet. Well, at that point, if you just have that and no guardrail, you may wanna add some guardrail below that conveyor um, so that you're still protected as you're walking down. I mean, keep the, the typical spacing of your guardrail on the opposite side, three foot six, one foot eight, um, do all that and have tow board and all that. Um, here's just an example of a, a fully graded truss and uh, you can see the legs come down. You gotta make sure that you do have steel below to support those legs. Maybe you run rails down on top of the grading. Maybe you have it below, depending on what the horizontal bracing is throughout the truss. You know, there's different ways to do it, but, but this is a, a much safer um, construction to have it this way and, and helps with maintenance. Um, tunnel access, hatch safety. Uh, a lot of times you'll see you go down a tunnel, you go bend to bend to bend, and they have padlocks on them. Well, what happens if a guy goes out there, unlocks a padlock, goes down that tunnel, and oh shoot, there's a fire now. And they go run down the tunnel and they go to open that hatch on the other side. Well, how are you getting out if there's a padlock on the outside? You're gonna call your buddy and hopefully you got your cell phone and are you gonna bang and yell or, or how are you gonna get out? So what we do is uh, we'll put a locking mechanism that you can still exit and use a handle and get out from anywhere, no matter if it's locked or not, but it does have a lock on the top, so you're protecting it when you're not there. You know, somebody sneaks onto your site, whatever, kids messing around, um, but you have that protection of nobody getting in, but everybody can get out. So that's a, that's a feature that we like to add to all of our hatches. Um, some greenfield considerations, and I'll just touch on this kind of quick. Um, because of timing, but uh, looking at access to the site, picking your site location, you know, are you gonna have rail access? Have you, have you talked to that rail uh, company? Are they gonna allow you to put a switch in there? Um, how often are they gonna service that switch? How often are you gonna be able to get cars in? Um, and then your truck traffic, how, how are you getting in and out? Is it in town, is it out of town? Uh, a lot of times they don't like you staging trucks in town or anywhere on a highway, and uh, you don't have enough space for those to be staged on site. So, so looking at that, um, talking with the uh, traffic um, highway department, DOT, with that is, is beneficial. And sometimes they may even increase, you know, put a turning lane in on a highway, and uh, they may front that cost, and it's gonna make it a lot safer for your drivers. And then looking at site grading and elevations. Um, our Humboldt site had roughly a 30 foot change in elevation from where we had our switch on our rail all the way to the back of our rail spur. So that's a lot of cut and fill. I mean, looking at that stuff ahead of time and including that into the cost of a green field is, is key. Um, and then public funding. Uh, it's always good to see what you can get Maybe you're doing job creation, maybe it's increased taxes, maybe they just look and there's an economical uh, development committee out there and they may say, hey, we're gonna help you with this. Or the utility company might say, hey, you're gonna now use all this gas or all this electric. Let's have them run it on our site all the way up to the meter. Sometimes they'll, they'll cover that cost and then from the meter on, you, you then cover. So looking at meter placement, you can get the free stuff all the way up to where you want it. It's better than having it out by the road. Um, so that's one thing that we've done in the past as well. And then um, looking at you know, room for expansion. So if you're gonna buy land and you're gonna do all this investment, don't buy just the bare bones, this is what we need. Um, buy the additional land so you have room for expansion. Uh, plus it's nice to not have some neighbor right next to you. Um, they don't usually like grain dust and all the noise and everything else. but. If you don't have the funds to do that, there are other opportunities. You could do a, a land option on, on purchasing that land. So maybe you say, hey, we're buying it for 5,000 an acre, 10,000 an acre. Um, this additional 
section of land, we want an option that we can buy it at that same price within the next five years. And, and then it's written that that's the price. You, you go in there and you buy it and then you say later on, hey, I want to buy more of your land. Well, that's great. You need that land and now you're going to pay for it. Uh, I mean, we've, we've had places uh, come in at, well, you need that to do a rail spur and you're just trucking right now. Well, I want 40 grand an acre. And you're like, okay, well, can't, can't uh, come down on price, can't do the rail spur without it. You're paying $160,000 for four acres, whereas if you would have bought it up front, you were paying 10,000. Um, that really is a, is a kick to the budget on that one. Um, and then uh, other greenfield considerations, um, you know, what are your receiving speeds? What are you looking at? You know, maybe you say, oh, well, I really want to do 200 trucks a day in our peak harvest time. Well, as you grow, you might want to do 450. Can you add a pit? Can you add another conveyor? Is that laid out? Is the tunnels and everything else sized appropriately? Um, and then, you know, dump pit sizes. So you could have a conveyor that goes at 30,000 an hour and you're only getting one hopper of the truck, well, you're not going at 30,000 an hour because you're not going to empty that truck hopper, move it forward, empty the second one and keep it up and keep that pit full. Um, so looking at do you have extended dumps that can fit both hoppers of a, of a truck? Are you going to have end dump trucks? You need to make sure that your overhead doors and things like that are, uh, are the right height. Um, but looking at speed and then uh, utilities available, one thing that we did with that greenfield is uh, the utility company said, you know, we were going to put light poles out around the, the roadways and it was going to be, you know, $1,500, $2,000 a pole. Well, they said, hey, you know, we'll, we'll lease you poles. We'll come, we'll put them in, we'll install them, we'll put LEDs, we'll do all the maintenance. Anything goes out, we fix it. All you got to do is run electric to it and then it's this much per month. Well, the payback on it was like 15 years, and that's with zero maintenance having to be done on them. So talk, talk to your utility companies about some of that stuff that they may be able to offer, um, as well as you know rebates and things if you use a certain percentage of uh, electricity. Um, and then um, I did forget to ask, oh, I don't know where that went. I did forget to ask um, who all is in the agricultural business. If you could raise your hand. Okay, and then we'll just start here for questions. Um, no. no, but uh, does anybody have any questions? Looks like we still have a little bit of time, right? Yeah? Okay. Well, no one has a few questions. I have a few questions. Great. Hopefully I can answer them. Well, that was a great presentation, Joel. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That was very, very informative, a lot of good information. And I guess one of my first questions is, how long did that take? How long was that project? Um, well, the planning part took a lot. Um, <laughs> and then getting approval for funding took even longer. But then once we broke ground, I believe it was uh, October to May. So uh, I think it was roughly about nine or 10 months. Went for construction. For construction from breaking ground, and there was a lot of dirt work that had to be done ahead of time, um, a lot. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, what were some of the lessons learned then from this project? Um, that's a good question. So some of the lessons learned uh, that I didn't maybe get into is, um, like you have a bin and you have your reclaim, well, you're only trying to reclaim at 20,000 an hour. Well, that doesn't mean you want to put in a 12 by 12 reclaim spout, go into that conveyor. You're going to plug it up. There might be issues. Um, oversize that thing. You know, you can always put a, a Anco gate on there or something to to reduce that. But if you start getting plugs and things like that, you're going to be in there prodding it with the rebar, trying to break those up. Um, so definitely oversize that. We had installed two of the bins, and the concrete was done. And we went out there and said, "Why are these gates so small? Like, why? Why? <laughs> what's happening here?" And so then the the next gates, we increased those by quite a bit, and uh, then we didn't have that issue. Um, so that's one. If you're going into a belt off of reclaim, um, sometimes you want to not just go straight vertical with that, but you want to kind of angle it into the belt the way the belt's traveling. 
um, or you got those side rails to kind of help keep that so it doesn't overflow onto the side of the belt. Those are some of the considerations. Um, if you have bobcat doors, you got to have um, a hopper to take that 2,000 bushels or whatever it is that, that comes out of the door when you first open it. So we put little hoppers in there. Well, we, they were actually quite big hoppers and we didn't catch that in design. So we kind of over designed those a little bit. Um, but those are just a couple of things. Now, were you on site for this project or was this long distance? This was down in Tennessee and I am in Ohio. So one thing that um, really helped out is we got a, a really good construction camera. Put it up on a telephone pole that actually the electrical company supplied for us. And uh, you know we were able to pan, zoom, tilt, live, do it from our cell phone or computer, whatever it might be. And I, I mean, these cameras are great quality. You can zoom in 400 feet and read somebody's name tag. So checking in daily, you know, seeing what, what you can get done, uh, what they that they're doing everything they need to. Also safety wise, just making sure that they're wearing the right PPE. You can just hit print screen and send it off to their, the, the GC and say, fix it or I will. <laughs> um, we, we caught openings that should have been poured into concrete. You know, as they're pouring, we say, hey, you're missing an opening over here. You know, different things like that. It really, really helped out. Um, so just adding a, a little bit of cost for the construction cameras <laughs> is very nice. And then also one other benefit to that is if you give the, uh, the boss of the, the GC or the concrete guy or whoever it might be access to it, well, they're going to log in every day and say, you know, you said you were going to get this done and I know you can get more done. And so they push their guys and it actually helps a little bit with the schedule. So given access, not just to your company, but also the contractors um, is beneficial when you're working remote. Did everyone hear that question back there? About the uh, the question was regarding the uh, speed conveyors. Speed of speed of drag conveyors yeah. and what what maybe we recommend or what we go with. Uh, depends if it's you know ethanol food grade, just general. Um, maybe 160 feet per minute. Stick around there. If it's something that we want to increase in the future, um, maybe we'll go 120, 140, and then be able to increase that later, uh, just with some different components. Uh, for the motor or whatever. Um, and if you're looking at, you know, is it going to damage the product? Is it a clean conveyor? Maybe you're going a little bit, you know, on that 120 range just normally. So I would, yeah, I would, uh, the question is how, how far in advance do you start the permit process? Um, depends on the permit. If it's a storm water, it's usually a 30 day notice. Um, air permits can be 30, 60, 90. Um, I like to start those 120. I mean, if you can, uh, there's certain air permits that you can't start construction until that notice is up. So you're just sitting there waiting. Contracts are done, everything's ready to go, and you're just waiting to mobilize because you can't start. Um, some crossing agreements and, and things like that, not necessarily a permit, but if uh, the railroad's saying, yeah, you're going to cross with your trucks, and this is a heavy railroad, well, you got to put in all the bells and whistles and we want lights, we want gates, we want the controls for that. I mean, you could be half a million dollars in. So uh, starting that process uh, and having their approval process takes months, really. And then just construction on its own. Um, you know, some authorities having jurisdiction might come in and say, yeah, we want to see everything before you pour. We want to inspect the rebar. Others are like, yeah, you got a special inspection. Just send us a report at the end. Give me the PE stamp drawings, and I'm good. That's the best bet. <laughs> um, we, you know, we've had issues where they said they were going to have them out. Then they ended up pouring, and they didn't come out. And then you wait and say, OK, well, here's our special inspections. Here's our reports. Can we get away with this, or do we have to rip out this giant foundation that you didn't see? Um, that can delay things quite a bit. So. How do you deal with um, uh, the, the reporting, the documentation? You know, different states are, are have different <clears throat> variations in it. You know, some states require 14-day documentation, making sure everything is all right. Um, or if you have a rain event, you know, making sure that it was documented after that, making sure your silt fence isn't half buried, so on and so forth. Yeah, we have on. We usually would have an on-site person, whether it's the contractor or the special inspection guys. Um, maybe we have a quality control person there, but we have them do the documentation on that, and and that's just the on-site stuff to to get all the behind the scenes and 
all the reports and permits submitted, I go to our environmental department. <laughs> they need to be certified and trained, correct? Um, if they're going to document for the SWIP. Well, I don't know how much training you really need. You might be able to train them yourselves, but going around and looking at is the salt fence, you know, still in good shape? How much rain did you get based off of, you know, the nearby airport that's telling you a gauge of that? Um, that type of documentation day to day or week to week. Typically, you know, if you got somebody out there doing quality control, they're going to be able to pick up on that and, and be able right. to be trained on it. But if you're going to document that, mm -hmm. In certain states, they require that you go through their training to do that, or okay, yeah. you put the monkey on the contractor's back because his name is on the SWIP. Right, and and that's you know state by state. That's what we would do if we had to have an on-site person that we we were regularly going to have out there, you know, just watching construction. Then we would have to put them through that training. Um, if it's something that doesn't require more than just hey, this is what you need to do, let's walk through it, let's check a couple times after you do it, make sure you're doing it right. Um, you know, send me a PDF or uh, take a picture and text it to me. Did you fill it out correctly? Check them and then once you know that they're doing good, just intermittent checks on it is, is what we would probably do. So you're asking um, if it includes ground piles or not? Is that yeah, in, some, some of the, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah. that's going to be addressed. Brian Wanzenried with Gavilon, that's uh, one of the issues he's going to be discussing uh, during the environmental issues presentation uh, that's at 11 o'clock today. So just as an FYI. But Yeah, I would say permanent storage is sometimes they, they don't include, include the ground piles. And to, to look, I mean, basically it's going to come down to federal. In, in my opinion. I mean, state might be more stringent, but typically the, the, the federal regulations are going to be more stringent on it. So whatever they require, and obviously we'll get into that a little bit more, yeah, hopefully. In National Grain Feed Association, we're very involved in that at the federal level that Brian will be talking about to provide a little bit more input on. One last question. Um, I'm just kind of curious, considering the, the cordial relationship that the agricultural industry has with the rail industry, uh, just curious how that uh, plays out too, you know, during the uh, the the, uh, the process you had in uh, constructing the new facility. Cordial, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's a lot of obviously delays, and, and I, I touched on a couple of those, but uh, getting a, a service agreement is is key. I mean, how many times are they going to bring you cars? How often are they going to bring you cars? What if you have an order? I mean, are you going to sit? Is it going to sit there? at their yard for a week and you know what are you going to have to merge style on um, all those need to be kind of spelled out into a service agreement you know are they bringing it on and that's it are they bringing it on and maybe you got a ladder track and they'll hook up to the one and then they'll hook up to the next and the next well if you just have a ladder track you might not be able to do that with your track mobile or your or your engine and um, so getting that what they're going to do what you're going to do getting it all spelled out documented and uh, you know, that's that's key to, to anything that you can be doing with the railroad um, if they can get them to call you back. <laughs> well, with that, I think it's, uh, I appreciate that. It was an excellent presentation, Joel. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and with that, it's, uh, it's time for